Welcome everyone to uh, Sessions in Church His History with Richard Allinger. I'm your host and I want to, Paul could you help me out with this, the seven principles of Kwanzaa? Would you say the Swahili and I'll say the English uh, 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 transliteration of it. Okay. Uh, because of the, uh, uh, during the Kwanzaa celebration here, this just this last week, seven candles are lit on a uh, 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 candelabrum or a menorah with seven candles and uh, they are when each one is lit during the Kwanzaa observance it's each one of the candles stand for one of the seven principles of Kwanzaa and and uh, Paul is going to help me out he's going to say the Swahili of the each of the seven candles and I'm going to say the English go ahead Paul well, as you know Richard Kwanzaa is based on the seven principles also known as the Nguza Saba the seven principles in Guza Saba. Thank you. And the first principle of uh, Kwanzaa, the first day, is the 26th, and it's Umoja. Okay. And that means, in English, unity. Correct. And then the second day is uh, Kuji Chagulia. And in English, that means self-determination. Ujima is the third day. Uh, collective work and responsibility. Ujima is the fourth day. Uh, cooperative economics. Fifth day is Nia. Uh, purpose. And then the sixth day is Kaumba. Creativity. And finally, the last and then seventh day is Imani. Imani, faith, and that's faith. Oh, I'm glad for that because in Hebrews chapter 6 it says, without faith it's impossible to please God. Oh, I better take my gloves off. It's really cold out. It's really cold out. I forgot to take my gloves off. Um, uh, I wanted to momentarily uh, go back uh, to uh, the uh, Region 1C over on Atherton Road and Van Slyke Road, the UAW Region 1C. This is where in December the NAACP held an election and lo and behold I found out that uh, the people that did vote for the president of the local chapter of the NAACP uh, voted for uh, the incumbent president, uh, uh, Francis Gilchrist. So when I learned of that, I went over to the uh, Union Hall and filled out forms to have her name engraved in a uh, brick of women that are in government. And uh, I wanted to, to get permission from also Eric Mace, who's the first city council seat, in the city of Flint to have permission uh, and Francis Gilchrist permission to have their names engraved in the brick but their voice mailboxes were full and I could not get a hold of them so I went ahead and uh, paid to have their names engraved in the brick uh, because Eric Mays uh, as you know was uh, we that are from General Motors uh, he was on the shop committee uh, with General Motors, the UAW shop committee, and he he arbitrated uh, 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 he arbitrated uh, disputes, labor disputes in the Office of Labor Relations. He was uh, arbitrating uh, disputes in the Office of Labor Re Relations for the UAW, and he also worked negotiating UAW contracts to make it better for all of us who were working in the factories through all the years past, and. Um, so uh, what I would like to do is uh, just momentarily go back to November 4th because when uh, in one of my previous broadcasts I spoke about uh, uh, you know urging all my UAW brothers and sisters to get out and vote and uh, you know only a fourth of the voters turned out for that uh, election day November 4th in 2014 mm -hmm. And um, they, they, the, the voters, it turned out, it was kind of a first snowy, wet day and kind of slippery on the roads, and maybe that contributed to people not coming out. But of the fourth of the people that did show up and voted in the November 4th election, now don't confuse that with the NAACP election for president that happened in December at the Region 1C on Atherton and Vance Lake Road. But... Uh, the, the fourth of the voters that did show up uh, said no to Republican senatorial candidate 
Terry Lynn Land for the U.S. Senate, and they said yes to Gary Peters uh, as senator. They said yes. And, you know, uh, Gary Peters, uh, want, he didn't want to see Obamacare repeated, or repealed, excuse me, whereas the Republican Terry Lynn Land wanted to see uh, the repeal of Obamacare, but the voters, it turned out, said no to her, and they said yes to Gary Peters. So it, uh, interpreting the fourth, it turned out, they, they don't really want to see uh, the repeal of Obamacare. That's what it says. Now, with that, in 2010, when the, um, in December of 2010 in Congress, when our 44th president, Barack Hussein Obama, signed health, uh, House Resolution Bill 656 health care reform into law, the people that were the distractors of that and did not want to see health care reform named it Obamacare. Mm -hmm. And that's what it's been called ever since. And they've been trying to uh, undo it ever since it was done up. And by the same token, because you know, uh, my sessions here uh, with Richard Allinger Presents are in church history, uh, I uh, wanted to tell you that by the same token, the people that wanted to see a health care reform undone or never become law named it Obamacare. And by the same token, in the first century, uh, it says in Acts chapter 11, verse 26, that in Antioch, the despised sect of Nazarenes were first called Christians. And the, the people that were persecuted, persecuting them and trying to stop what they were doing called them Christians because they were known as Nazarenes, a despised sect of what they thought was Judaism. And, and then, uh, by the same token, in the 60s, you, you know, I've been talking uh, in the last previous broadcast about Martin Luther in October, just before the November 4th election in 2014. That was October 31st, just a few days before the November 4th uh, election for the senator and governor here in Michigan. Uh, they, uh, they, it was the 497th anniversary of Martin Luther writing his 95 thesis against the Roman Catholic Church and I had been talking about that and by the same token the people that persecuted the the Nazarenes in the first century the followers of Christ calling them first Christians in Antioch uh, and the people that didn't want to see health care reform in 2010 when it was written into law by our president, they called it Obamacare because he was the president that signed it and made it law. And by the same token, in the 16th century, when I told you in previous programs that the Protestant Reformation, which really started around the time in the 16th century when Martin Luther wrote the 95 Thesis, uh, the uh, there was people that uh, were part of that Protestant Reformation that after it began to happen and shift like in a northwest position uh, from Germany up into around uh, England and with a missionary outreach to uh, Africa and uh, North America and South America, uh, there were some that had distinctives in their articles of faith and in their confession uh, that were named by the people uh, that didn't like them, uh, Anabaptists. So those that were like Baptists, they, they were first called Anabaptists by uh, the, 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 uh, the persecutors of those that did not want to really join in the Roman Catholic hierarchical uh, polity of ch uh, church and state. Because one of the distinctives of the Baptists are what the 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 uh, persecutors of the Baptists they they named them Anabaptists and that means uh, rebaptize because the Roman Catholic Church and I touched upon this a little bit in previous sessions 
uh, in the f uh, first, uh, maybe uh, after three or four hundred years so after Christ had ascended, begin to want to inf uh, baptize infants. And that's something that uh, the, the Baptists have never done, is baptize infants. And I don't know if Christ taught that. Uh, the Baptists kind of believe that a child has to be of an age of an accountability and know right from wrong before and get saved and then baptize him, uh, uh, fully immersing him under water. You see, where the Roman Catholic Church wants to sprinkle water on infants, and that's something the Baptists do not do. And so those that didn't really like what the Baptists believed, uh, they believed in separation of church and state, and they wouldn't be involved with uh, Constantine when the Roman emperor said, well, I'm going to make Christianity the official uh, um, religion of the uh, Roman Empire, but then as popes in Rome began to... Uh, aspire to power in this uh, new decree, they were beginning to say the Bible is what we say it is. And what they were saying the Bible said didn't line up with what Christ taught. So that's what caused the split that I talked with you about later on uh, around the 9th and 10th century when there was a split. The, the Eastern Empire split from the Western Roman Empire. And I'll, I'll be talking about that later. Uh, but uh, I just wanted you to know that the enemies of the Nazarenes called them Christians first. The enemies of uh, the uh, people that were part of the Protestant Reformation protesting what Rome was doing, they were Baptists, but they were called by their enemies Anabaptists. And by the same token, uh, because President Obama, in December of 2010, during a session of Congress, signed health care reform uh, bill uh, into law, his distractors, or the ones that didn't like it, called it Obamacare. And I just thought that you might see a, a, a similarity there. But And I do believe that when you, uh, at, at the end of the day, when history is over for America as a nation, uh, you'll look back, and I think uh, I will just quote what uh, FDR said, because these were the words of FDR before he died. In 1935, FDR actually, you know, signed a, and I referred to this in previous broadcasts that FDR had signed uh, uh, federal mandates making it legal to have uh, labor unions and because he he did this it was possible for the historic 1937 UAW sit down strike to happen here in Flint Michigan you know and uh, and if FDR wouldn't have mandated that uh, the strike would have never taken place and so uh, and then shortly thereafter 1935 President uh, R Franklin Roosevelt brought in Social Security to uh, uh, give older people that no longer can, they're, they're in retirement age, uh, a monthly uh, disbursement of money to help in their cost of living, meet their cost of living, and to, uh, later on to help uh, people that are disabled also. And Social Security was a good thing. And, uh, and then as I talked in previous broadcasts, uh, uh, later on LBJ, uh, after JFK's assassination, uh, signed the Medicare laws I I into uh, law, and this was going to help older people receive the medical benefits that they would need uh, as they get older and uh, need medical attention. And sometimes, as you know, uh, m medical care is exorbitant in its cost. Uh, and um, and then when President Obama in uh, December of 2010 signed the health care reform, uh, uh, it, it, uh, at the end of the day, when you look back in history to America as a nation, as FDR said, because, and it was the Democratic presidents that were in power when these kind of things came about to help people in our country, that at the end of the day, when you look back, uh, um, the, uh, the American government and, and the persons of its democratic presidents 
will be the Good Samaritans, uh, according to the parables of Jesus. There was a uh, man that was robbed and beaten uh, uh, on the road going to Samaria in one of Jesus' parables, and two religious fellows passed him by, but the Good Samaritan stopped, and he he was robbed and beaten and the Good Samaritan gave the robbed and beaten man health care and this is what President Obama has given now people no matter who you are in this country or if you need medical attention you're gonna get it now because of health care reform and that's what the the Good Samaritan did he gave uh, health care to this man that was robbed and beaten and not only did he do that but he gave him a roof over his head uh, 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 a keep at an end because he was robbed of his money and he also gave him a bridge card I mean you know food stamps or uh, money to help feed him and see so President uh, FDR before he died said that he feels at the end of the day because the Democratic president's making these decisions with regard to Social Security and uh, FDR and Medicare, LBJ, back in the 60s, and uh, uh, health care reform here in 2010 with President Obama, that at the end of the day, America will be looked upon as the Good Samaritan for having brought this about. Even though some of the people look at it in, in a different light and uh, can't, can't see it as uh, Jesus taught in that parable of the Good Samaritan the needs of people. I think America is is, is uh, going to be, uh, at the end of the day, a better government for having done these things. And uh, uh, in 1968, uh, I had graduated from Flint Southwestern High School in 1967, and uh, I attended uh, I joined the Marine Corps around that time with uh, one of my friends uh, Daniel uh, McIntosh uh, I went to high school with him and we both after we both got back from Vietnam we were both we enlisted in the Marine Corps we were members of the same uh, colonial village Pentecostal Church of the Nazarene here in Flint and what Dan had done something though that I hadn't done Daniel McIntosh he he uh, after he got out of high school he was uh, employed by General Motors and because he worked at the V8 engine plant and because he was employed there even though he volunteered to go to the Vietnam War uh, GM said well you go ahead and go to the Marine Corps in the Vietnam War Daniel but when you get back all the time because you've already hired in and you're working for us building engine blocks at the V8 engine plant. If you remember, it was out there across the street from the local 659 on Van Slyke. Uh, since then, because, uh, you know, we, uh, Roger Smith, the former CEO of General Motors back in 1987, shocked this region uh, by announcing 14 plant closings. And that brought the population of Flint over the last 20, 30 years almost cut it in half and people have had to go elsewhere to even find employment that lived here uh, and I, I kind of think that the even though I thank God for General Motors Corporation I kind of you know believe that the highest levels of General Motors Corporation you know you know it's multinational uh, international it's one of the largest corporations in the world I, I don't think they were too happy uh, you know, with Flint, Michigan, and Detroit, because this is where the labor union movement all started back in the 30s, after FDR manda mandated that uh, it was legal to have a autos workers union and have union UAW representatives negotiate contracts between the auto workers and the company. And uh, as I said in previous broadcasts. Uh, Henry Ford owned the Ford Motor Company and when he heard that he was going to have to work with uh, uh, auto uh, UAW negotiators he was thinking about shutting his family owned business down but the way things worked out he decided to accept them 
as negotiators for the workers, and that's then 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 the sit down strike happened up here in Flint, Michigan, in 1937, and all the people that live here in Flint, Michigan, I'm sure they're uh, knowledgeable of that historic event. And I had been talking on previous broadcasts about the uh, almost it's a hundred and fifty thousand, two hundred thousand dollar monument of marble, uh, brick, and bronze monument to memorialize this uh, historic event that happened in 1937 here in Flint, Michigan. Now, uh, my mother's neighbor over on Pershing Street, across the street from Eisenhower School, he was one of the 22, uh, his name was Bob Robert Mamro, and he was one of the 22 people that stayed in the factory uh, from December 26th to February 11th, and GM shut off the heat and uh, women had to come down and break windows out and bring those men. Uh, they slept on car seats, food in a picnic basket. And uh, th when things began to get out of hand and the local police couldn't handle the big crowds, uh, they had to call Governor Murphy and the National Guard in. And my neighbor, uh, my mother's neighbor, Robert Mamro, took a bullet uh, that the National Guard shot into them. And I guess, I don't know if they shot to kill, but my neighbor was actually shot by the National Guard, Robert Mamro. And uh, so, uh, we before Robert Mamro died, you know, I used to talk to him about that. And uh, now, when I had joined the Marine Corps with my uh, friend that I went to high school with, uh, Daniel McIntosh, we both got orders for Vietnam out of basic training in the Marine Corps. Uh, we went to the uh, Marine Corps Recruit Depot uh, in San Diego for our basic training and then staging battalion. And around this time, uh, when I was being uh, processed and Daniel and I were going to Vietnam, uh, this is when the tragic assassination of Martin Luther King happened and uh, then and that was in April down in uh, Memphis Tennessee at the Lorraine Motel uh, Martin Luther King was assassinated and then shortly thereafter in the summer of 1968 Robert Kennedy uh, John Kennedy's brother uh, got the nomination from the Democratic National Convention to run for the 1968 uh, presidential election in November, but somebody assassinated him uh, just after Martin Luther King was assassinated. And uh, I, I didn't even know any of this happened because I was in staging battalion to go to Vietnam and they, they didn't tell me anything about what was going on out in the world. You know, and uh, uh, even when I went to Vietnam for 13 months, 10 miles south of the DMZ, I didn't hear about anything that was going on over here. Uh, we didn't have, like, radios or televisions, and any radio transmission that I ever heard, it was a woman called Tokyo Rose, and she was telling us in English how stupid we were uh, over there in Vietnam and fighting uh, the North Vietnamese government and... Uh, and that's all we heard was how stupid we were for being over there. You know, we didn't hear anything about what was going on over here in the United States. And, uh, you know, I was uh, almost killed in a fatal rocket attack 10 miles south of the DMZ where I was stationed at the 3rd Marine Aircraft Wing uh, group up in Quang Tri, uh, South Vietnam, and up and around Dong Ha, Vietnam. Uh, the Viet Cong would try to lob rockets in uh, over the perimeter at night to try to hit the United States medevac helicopters. And if they could hit one of those helicopters, it would cost the uh, American government about $1.7 million. But sometimes those rockets would not hit the helicopter pad, and they came very close to hitting where, where I was at. And I didn't think I was going to be coming back here. My mother, when I got back, told me she be believed in angelic uh, protection, you know, and she was so glad that I got back. And my friend Daniel uh, McIntosh made it back too, but he was wounded and received uh, a Purple Heart for him being wounded over there in the Marine Corps 
they were in the thick of it back in the, the case on Tet Offensive in 68. But Daniel, my friend, and I both got back, and uh, I'm just so glad that we got back. And then Daniel picked up his employment at the V8 engine plant because he had already worked in the factory before he uh, was in the Marine Corps. Uh, they let all the time he was in serving the country uh, be toward his retirement for seniority in GM. According to the UAW contract, you need uh, 30 years employment before you can retire with a full pension and all the benefits that go with that, medical benefits and so on. Uh, when you get older, after you retire, you might need hearing aids and reading glasses, you know, and other things you, you begin to lose. <laughs> I'm so glad that I still have my mind, you know. <laughs> but, uh, uh, we're going to take a break here in about three minutes, Richard. Okay, all right. Uh, and in the three minutes, uh, uh, what I want to talk about is uh, the fact that uh, after working there at Melafab and over at the V8 engine plant, the plant managers, the Holy Spirit, moved on the plant managers' hearts at the V8 engine plant, the truck and bus plant over there on Vance Lake Road, and the metal fabrication plant to actually uh, give a staff conference room to all of the uh, Christian men and women that were employees there, where on their lunch breaks they could meet. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about uh, in the next uh, sh uh, session. But uh, I wanted to talk with you about those GM installations uh, were like little cities. There are sometimes 3,000 people employed in each one of the facilities. And so uh, it was an opportunity for me to get to know a lot of people in the faith community. And that's what I want to talk with you about uh, in the next session. Uh, all right, I'll see you when, uh, and I hope you come back. Juneteenth, a time to reflect and rejoice. Join the village. Celebrate African American Independence Day. Honestly, dude, I did the most shocking thing today. It was just something I never thought I'd do. Did your parents find out? My mom cried. What'd you do?
Oh, I'm glad you're back. Uh, because I wanted to share with you, uh, I wanted to give a shout out to all the people that I worked with through the 31 years that I worked with at the metal fabrication plant out in uh, uh, on Bristol Road out by the Bishop Airport here in Flint, Michigan. And I just thank God that uh, uh, local 659 president David Benjamin uh, was able to use his uh, uh, clout as president to uh, get me employment at Metalfab at a time when they weren't really hiring. They just, there was a six month uh, strike uh, of the workers in 1970 and the employment office weren't, weren't hiring. But I went over and knocked on uh, local 659 President David Benjamin's door. And uh, when I told him that I uh, was a Vietnam veteran and had a wife and two children and no employment uh, he interrupted his meeting in his uh, office and got on the phone and he called over to the factory and they said well we need a hand arc welder and uh, Dave, Dave Benjamin said well Richard do you want to be a hand arc welder and I so, said oh thank you thank you uh, beggars can't be choosy yes I, I, I'm just glad to work for General Motors he said well go across the street and uh, take your physical, and then you're going to be hiring in on October 10th, 1971, at the metal fabrication plant, uh, which is uh, G2238 West Bristol Road, out by Bishop Airport. So I hired in there as a welder, and I just thank God that uh, Dave Benjamin took the time to get me employment at a time they weren't really hiring when because of the president's clout was able to get me in the UAW president and uh, on that note while we were working in the factories through all those years uh, before the Holy Ghost had moved on the plant managers heart to to open up a staff conference room for the Christian men and women to meet on their lunch breaks to uh, have a little bit of singing hymns and praise and worship and uh, praying and uh, also, hearing a word from one of the pastors that worked there, uh, uh, they they uh, uh, before the Holy Ghost had moved on the plant manager's heart to open up a staff conference room for the Christian men and women to meet. Uh, the women were meeting. The women Christians were meeting in the women's locker room, and at, at, at this is at the V8 engine plant too and other GM facilities and uh, in the 80s, 1980s, and the men were meeting in the, on their breaks, on their lunch breaks in the men's locker room and they were uh, reading the Bible and praying. And uh, uh, however, in the process of time, uh, the Holy Ghost moving on the plant manager's heart uh, in opening up a staff conference room for the men and women Christians to come together on their lunch breaks, we begin to meet all the Christians in, in the buildings, that, like at Metal Fab, all three shifts. Uh, we called the executive, uh, one of the uh, executive boardrooms that we met in the prayer room. And sometimes the paymaster would uh, pay off all the uh, paychecks there too before there was electronic uh, digital disbursements of money. There was always paper paychecks that they would give the supervisors and the supervisors would then take the paper paychecks during the duration of a shift, first, second, and third shift, and give each employee their weekly pay. But uh, with digital technology, that's kind of changed everything. Uh, but they, this is the room we call the prayer room. Uh, sometimes the paymaster paid off in that room, uh, the supervisors, to pay the employees. And, uh, and this is how we, all the Christians and those large factories begin to meet on a daily basis all three shifts there was anywhere from uh, maybe uh, 8 to uh, 24 people that would meet on the lunch break sometimes it might go up to 30 and there we would sing hymns and uh, then we would pray that the Lord because in the 80s when this all began to happen you know there was uh, the CEO of General Motors Roger Smith had announced uh, uh, 14 plant closings. So we were praying that the plants that had not been closed up to this point, that the Lord would work in such a way 
as far as uh, quality and the numbers of production that the corporation needed to keep these plants open and that all the employees would work towards quality and building a good product so that uh, the doors wouldn't be closed like they had been closed in other facilities down at Buick City and out at the AC complex and as you know the V8 engine plant was imploded too after uh, the 1987-14 uh, plant closings and announcement was made and uh, so this is where we begin to, Dan, my friend Daniel McIntosh that worked on the engine block line uh, over at uh, the V8 engine plant, uh, uh, I was told by the uh, director of our Bible Institute, the United Bible Institute, uh, Dr. Henry Fuller, that he worked uh, at a time with Daniel McIntosh uh, back in the uh, 80s before he retired uh, in the V8 engine plant before it was imploded and uh, also uh, one of the Flint Bible Institute instructors for over 40 years the Reverend the late Reverend James Hoyle uh, of the New Hope Missionary Baptist Church was a teacher at the Flint Bible Institute for 40 years on Bible exposition and he had worked with my friend Daniel McIntosh too at the V8 engine plant and uh, uh, and then uh, there was also uh, uh, one of the pastors I come to uh, know at Metal Fab was Dr. James Wheeler he was an electrician at the Metal Fab plant where I worked and uh, he on our lunch breaks would open the word of God and uh, give us a, a teaching and uh, Dr. Wheeler uh, actually was used by the Lord to uh, be the founder of a Bible college here in Flint, Michigan because sadly uh, Flint, Michigan even though it was the headquarters of the mass production of automobiles with the founding of General Motors like Detroit Flint was a little Detroit uh, Flint, Michigan, in its history, never got a theological seminary where uh, uh, someone that wanted to study uh, theology or religious education could get an earned degree from the state of Michigan. So this is why uh, Dr. James Wheeler founded uh, in his uh, church, the Full Gospel Christian Church up on Martin Luther King, a uh, Bible college where People that live right here in Flint, Michigan can attend and get an earned bachelor's degree in theology, a master's degree in theology. Uh, they sometimes at different uh, se seminaries like the one down in Detroit, the Detroit Baptist Theological Seminary in Allen Park actually call it an MDiv. It's a master's degree in divinity and or you can get a, uh, a doctorate in theology, a PhD in religion and so on. This can all be done at Dr. Wheeler's Bible College and by the same token uh, the late Reverend Dr. Granville Smith and the late uh, Reverend Dr. Arthur J. Pointer uh, of the Metropolitan Missionary Baptist Church here in Flint, Michigan and uh, Dr. Smith of the Mount Calvary Missionary Baptist Church in the 70s also so from Monroe Louisiana brought a satellite of the United Theological Seminary here to Flint Michigan housed at Mount Calvary 4805 North Saginaw Street and here now people can actually here in Flint uh, can go and attend this Bible College and get an earned bachelor's degree in theology or a bachelor's degree in religious education, a master's degree in theology called a master of MDiv, a master of divinity, or a master's degree in religious education. And now many of the Bible colleges are getting going online, and you can actually work online and uh, for at uh, the home campus uh, where these satellites are operating, and you can go online and actually work for a, a doctorate in theology also. Uh, digital technology has really enhanced uh, the Christian educator's ability to propagate the gospel and to increase uh, Bible literacy 
not only in our community, uh, citywide and nationwide, but worldwide. Uh, as you know, uh, with the uh, satellites now uh, and digital technology, uh, Christian broadcasting is going into over 200 nations uh, in over 80 different languages with the good news. And this is just a miracle of which we thank uh, the good Lord Jesus Christ for. It's really good news. And uh, uh, in the previous broadcast, uh, I wanted to recognize all of these men who were faithful pastors. It's quite a job to hold down the responsibilities of a local assembly of believers being a pastor at these different churches. But in addition to all the pastoral uh, um, uh, responsibilities. Uh, these men that I have been talking about held jobs down in General Motors, plus held, met all the responsibilities at their local church assemblies, and also brought in to their churches a satellite uh, uh, seminary or founded a seminary in Flint because for some reason Flint never got a theological seminary and so I'm glad that we have these faithful GM employees and retirees and these pastors of these churches that have brought uh, these institutions into our community and uh, this right here uh, now the Flint Bible Institute uh, is like a mini theological seminary and in other future broadcasts I will speak to you about what why do we want a Bible college in our community? Why we need a Bible college in our community and theological seminary? Now, the Flint Bible Institute has been here for 60 years. Uh, it was founded uh, around the time of the Beecher Tornado, uh, back when Eisenhower was president in 1953, 52-53. And uh, this is an accredited institution also, and you can get an uh, you can't get an earned degree from the state of Michigan at the Flint Bible Institute, but you can get a one-year, a three-year, and a five-year diploma like this. And uh, I, I was awarded a one-year, a three-year, and a five-year completion certificate at the Flint Bible Institute. And the content of my education, I'll speak with you in another session, but... I did, after graduating from the one-year, the three-year, and the five-year program at the Flint Bible Institute, uh, then went to uh, the United Theological Seminary and Bible College that is housed in uh, Mount Calvary Missionary Baptist Church, 4805 North Saginaw Street, and it's a satellite, and the home campus is down in Monroe, Louisiana, and it's been there ever since 19... 52. And what I have done in 2012 was earned a uh, bachelor's degree in religious education there at this theological uh, seminary. And I wouldn't have been able to do that as a citizen of Flint from the state of Louisiana is where this came from if it had not been for uh, the satellite here. Now in uh, secular education Mock College has a satellite out in Lapeer, so the kids in Lapeer don't have to come into Flint to work for their associate's degree. By the same token, this is what uh, the late Dr. Granville Smith and the late uh, Reverend Dr. Arthur J. Pointer did in bringing the United Theological Seminary here. And also up in Birch Run, because uh, students come down from Saginaw to Flint to this uh, uh, Bible college, because there isn't anything up in Saginaw's way. And uh, with that, we do have Pastor Rodriguez and the Agape Praise Fellowship in Birch Run. Uh, some of his uh, 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 church members I worked with at Metal Fab, and we've been there before in uh, revival services. And even one of his uh, congregants or members, Tracy, is attending the UBI uh, of the UTS here. Uh, with me right now. And I'm in pursuit of a Septuagint. Uh, that is, they call it LXX. It's a 
uh, about 300 years before Christ, 12 men from each one of the 12 tribes of Israel met in Alexandria, a city in North Africa, and brought together the Greek version, the Septuagint, of the Hebrew uh, uh, Pentateuch and Prophets, the Torah, and put it in Greek. And that was 300 years before Christ, and we're studying the Septuagint called the LXX right now in classes in our uh, winter spring session that starts next week. And before this session ends, I wanted to make the announcement that uh, all of these men that I spoke with you about that have, are responsible for bringing uh, the uh, Bible colleges here to Flint, Michigan, uh, the late Reverend Don O'Dell uh, of the Flint Bible Institute and the others that I spoke with you about, uh, Dr. the late Reverend Dr. Obadiah Thompson, uh, who were teachers on the staff there, uh, instead of putting each and every one of their names in that 1937 Region 1C uh, monument that memorializes the historic 1937 sit-down strike, I did put the Great Lakes Baptist District in a brick there where a lot of these ministers are now still functioning and operating and that haven't went home to be with the Lord yet. And in memory of them, I put that there. And also the Church of God in Christ, the north central jurisdiction of the Church of God in Christ. Many of them were GM employees too and pastors of churches. And uh, we're going to have at First Trinity, we're going to meet at around 1030 in the morning at First Trinity Missionary Baptist Church. Uh, Marion uh, uh, Hawkenhall will be hosting and uh, uh, we're uh, Pastor Kim Yarber uh, he's the president uh, Mount Her he's the uh, pastor of the Mount Herman uh, Missionary Baptist Church and he's now the president of the uh, Congress of the uh, Genesee uh, of the uh, Great Lakes Baptist District He's the president, and we're going to be meeting him, and he's orchestrating a march from uh, on Monday, the 19th of January, uh, in, in front of the uh, First Trinity Missionary Baptist Church downtown. We're going to meet there at 1030 in the morning, and we're going to march uh, like we did last year on Martin Luther King uh, Day Observed, when the actually it's a national holiday and the government banks, government jobs, civil service jobs closed down, and the banks closed and we're going to be having an, an observance and uh, we're going to be marching uh, from First Trinity down to the Sheriff Piquel's, Genesee County Sheriff Piquel's office and the building where there's temporary incarceration uh, at the Genesee County building of temporary incarceration and Genesee County Sheriff Robert Piquel's office. We, as we did last year, we're going to stop there and pray and then we're going to march over to the Genesee County Courthouse building and administrative offices building and we're going to pray there and then we're going to march over to the Flint City Hall and we will pray there and then we're going to march back to First Trinity and uh, the uh, uh, Reverend uh, Quentin uh, Marshall who is uh, pastor of the New Life Church of God in Christ will be the keynote speaker he will bring, be bringing the message with regard to remembering uh, the Martin Luther King dream and his legacy of all Jews and Gentiles living together in, in peace and harmony. So that will be going on and if you're not doing anything you, you might want to get your uh, coats and your galoshes on and your gloves and your hats and meet us as we all assemble to remember the dreamer like Joseph and the uh, prophet like Moses who saw the promised land, he, uh, like Dr. King said the night before he was assassinated back in 68, I, God has allowed me to go up the mountaintop and I've looked on over and I might not get there with you, but we as a people will get to the promised land. I have a dream. And so we're going to be meeting this coming Monday, the 19th of January at 1030 at First Trinity Missionary Baptist Church uh, to remember the Martin Luther King Day uh, legacy and to keep the dream alive. Um, uh, Dr. King, today is the 14th, January 14th, so Dr. King's birthday though, his real birthday, 
when he was born as a baby to his mother, uh, the, uh, it was January 15th, even though we're going to observe that day, this Monday, the 19th, uh, at First Trinity Missionary Baptist Church. Uh, Paul? How much more time have I got? You've got about five minutes left. All right, in the, in the closing five minutes, uh, because uh, I have uh, a couple friends, a married couple, Doug and Jan Ungerford. Doug is up in his 80s now, and uh, he owns the uh, uh, Lighthouse Bible and Herb Shop out uh, in Swartz Creek, Michigan. If you Going out to Swartz Creek from Flat, if you just stay on Miller Road, go through the city, it's next to the Dairy Queen in a strip mall, and it's uh, Suite 3, and it's a Lighthouse Bible and Herb Shop, and he has a liquidation sale. He has a $50,000 inventory that he wants to liquidate and retire now that he's getting older. And Doug and Jan, uh, as I said before, with uh, my friend Daniel McIntosh, we all attended the Colonial Village Pentecostal Church of the Nazarene before. And uh, so I told him that I would just speak momentarily. Uh, uh, now, he has these uh, Elijah cups out there for sale for any Jews that live in the community. He has these Elijah cups and uh, uh, also the, uh, this is what you call a matzah dish and uh, at Passover for, uh, you know, we have three Jewish synagogues here in Flint, Rabbi Weingarten Sabad, Congregation Beth Israel and Temple Beth El out on Calkins Road. And Passover is coming up in April, so if you if you need an Elijah cup or a matzah dish to put the matzah in, this is what they the Jews are remembering, how they had to leave uh, Egyptian bondage after 400 years. God raised up Moses to bring them out with rapidity, and they didn't have time to bake their bread. So that's why they have this matzah dish at Passover, and they eat it with a root of horseradish because slavery was bitter and has that root of horseradish stings your tongue. It was bitter. It reminds them of the bitterness of bondage, and they thank the Lord for delivering them through the earthly ministry of Moses. And then Elijah, the cup, they always pour a cup of wine for Elijah, and they're waiting. The Jews are looking for Elijah to come and drink from their Passover Seder when they remember this historic event in the book of Exodus of the Old Testament. And then also, Doug and Jan out to Lighthouse have these Thomas Kincaid cards, uh, anniversary cards, birthday cards. These are the, some of the best cards you can get. Uh, and uh, also they have candles, candles uh, for services. Uh, they have, uh, uh, like I can't take Lipitor, I have high cholesterol, but these uh, herbs, you just take these herbs and uh, it reduces your cholesterol without, Lipitor causes pain in my body and I can't sleep with Lipitor, what the doctors give me. so. This supplement here, they have shelves of this stuff. This is a small bottle. They have quart bottles of all this stuff that can help you. Any different phys physiological condition you've got, they've got an herb to treat it. So if you can get out there. And then this is a little uh, uh, scripture verse box, uh, Crystal. And you can, uh, they have scripture verses in here. And uh, it says, God, thank you for loving me for myself and dying that I might live Teach me to feel that kind of love for others as well as myself. You can buy these little like trinkets like that. And then uh, here's for ladies that have a fireplace mantle or a china cupboard. You, you set this dish. This is Jesus praying uh, in Gethsemane. This is uh, where Jesus surrendered his life praying, Not my will, Father, but thy will be done in the Garden of Gethsemane. They say that you can't get closer to Father God in heaven than being in a garden. This is where Je Jesus surrendered his life before his death uh, and uh, burial and resurrection in Jerusalem. And then, uh, oh, also for the Jews, they do have prayer shawls. And what they're going to do in this liquidation sale to move out $50,000 in inventory, they're going to give you 25% off any Bible you want. They've got uh, Dr. David Jeremiah's study Bibles. They have uh, Dr. Um, John MacArthur's study Bibles, Hebrew and Greek study Bibles, and you can get 25% off all these Bibles, Schofield Bibles, and you can get, if you, and then the, these things, like the trinkets, uh, buy two, get one free. Uh, and, like, here's another trinket that says, uh, if tears could build a sanctuary and memories a lane, I'd walk right up to heaven and bring you home again. 
two minutes. So, so you can, and then like women that collect knickknacks, this is, uh, well, if you look at it, it's a bearded, old bearded man with a beard and he's got a dove. I think that's probably Noah because it was the dove that told Noah he found land once the flood uh, subsided, the wa flood water subsided. You can buy one of these. And in the, clo and, and in the closing minutes, uh, I want to tell you that the uh, refer there's a new updated Reformation Study Bible that if you'll call this number right here and uh, give them any amount of money, even like one penny, they will send you a free Reformation Study Bible. You, uh, all you got to do is just call this number. Uh, and this number is 1-800-435-4343. Let me repeat that. If you want a free Reformation Study Bible, just call one 800 435 Four three five four three four three, and if you send any amount of money in, either digitally with your debit card or through the mail, they will give you a free Reformation Study Bible, and that is really a good deal. If you could see this updated version of the Reformation Study Bible, let me give that number to you one more time: one eight hundred. Four three five four three four three, and that sale goes to the end of March, end of February. Excuse me. Okay, is it done? Oh, okay. One more minute. Okay, five seconds. Uh, all right. Uh, I just want you to remember that uh, God is still on His throne, and prayer changes things. And uh, what I want you to remember is that Jesus Christ is our Savior. Jesus Christ is our baptizer in the Holy Ghost. Jesus Christ is our healer. He was wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities. And Jesus Christ is our soon coming King. Uh, and I will look forward to seeing you in one of my next sessions. Richard Allinger presents Sessions in Church History. I will see you later.